morning. Everything working? Can you hear me? Can you understand me? How about that? Is that a better question? Uh, Mary, my better half, is in the front of front, uh, the room. Uh, we've been traveling for the last month or so. We attended the Australian Beekeepers Conference uh, the end of June, and we've just been having a ball getting a chance to see what beekeeping down under is, is all about. Um, of course, it's a little bit different in Australia than, than it is here, and we're learning about that. Um, this is my first trip to New Zealand. Uh, very excited to, to be here. Had a chance to look at some bee yards and what gorgeous country. So uh, I'm going to tell you, share with you a little bit about what we do in the States. Um, one of the things we learned early on is American television gives you a certain perspective on what the U.S. is all about. But beekeeping, oh, don't, don't hold that against me. Uh, <coughs> Beekeeping is a universal language, it's a universal culture, and um, it's just always enjoyable to, to visit with beekeepers and uh, to learn what they do and to compare notes. So uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, uh, my operation, if this works. So the first thing is the size of, of the United States. It's really a large country. I, I guess it's roughly the size of Australia, but we don't have that, middle, that area in the middle that, that isn't as useful. Well, beekeeping is good. All, uh, <laughs> I was trying to be polite. <laughs> uh, the Aussies warned me to not to say bad things about them. Uh, so um, in any event, um, beekeeping is good all over the United States, but the size of the country um, is really an issue. And uh, what's really driving beekeeping in, in uh, the United States is almond pollination. Uh, we're continually told that we have 2.7 million hives in the U.S., but that includes uh, every backyard beekeeper with five hives or more. So uh, the single almond pollination, which occurs in the middle of the winter, which is the, should be the low point for most beekeepers and their hive count, takes two million hives. There's a million acres, that, and they're still planting, by the way. Um, a million acres of almonds takes two million hives of bees, and uh, 90% or more of the commercial beekeepers in the United States are now pollinating almonds. It's a 400-mile uh, valley from north to south. I'm going to show you some pictures. But the significant thing here now is that, that uh, beekeepers in the U.S. depend more on pollination fees than they do on honey production. So we've, we've kind of transitioned from producing a product to providing a service. And after almond, almond pollination, uh, you're going to have to excuse me for the months. It's in the middle of the winter, which for us is February and, and March. It's still uh, late winter, uh, early spring. Uh, after almond pollination, the, those two million plus hives spread all over the place. Uh, roughly half a million stay in California um, to, to make honey or to raise queens or other things. The majority of hives go to the Midwest uh, for honey production. That would be the Dakota, North Dakota alone takes 500,000 hives. It a, a, used to be a wonderful place to make honey. It's still as good as we have, but uh, we've lost a lot of uh, good forage plants, so we're, we're working on that. Uh, and in my particular operation, I went back to the East Coast. So um, the, the joke is that in California almonds, there's a, a large sucking sound that, that pulls bees into California from all over the country. Uh, in my case, I was going almost 3,000 miles across the country, but you can see that, that bees come from all over. My company was Headwaters Farm. Uh, I ran close to 20,000 hives. I sold it uh, in 2015 to one of my large almond growers. Uh, but just to give you a feel for our pollination season, we had roughly six months of pollination season, which would start um, in, we would start shipping bees in January, but roughly from February through the end of uh, uh, July, uh, we would do, uh, to keep things simple, we kept it ABC. It was very convenient that the, the plants uh, accommodated A for almonds, B for blueberries, C for cranberries. But you can see we were moving a lot of bees. So this is my circuit in the U.S., and to put that into miles, we were, our bees were running about 9,000 miles. So um, they're busy. And I'm going to run you through our season just to give you a feel for it. I promise I have some, some nice pictures, uh, not just writing here, but to give you a feel for it. January isn't necessarily the beginning of our bee season, 
but uh, being in the northern hemisphere, the shortest day of, of the year is December 21st. In uh, our climate in Florida, we had warm weather. December 22nd, we started to, the, the day length increase, which is key for bees to grow, springtime conditions, and we had fresh pollen coming in the front door. So we had temperature, we had pollen, uh, and we had the right conditions. Uh, willow in my part of Florida, uh, usually South Florida, we have willow blooming as you go a little bit further north in Florida, as maple and other things, but the, the important thing is we're, we're there to get that early pollen. And we ha typically have large yards that time of year, 200 hives or more, and we're feeding sucrose to, to make the bees grow, and they do take off. Uh, in my company, we had close to 50 employees, and there were certain times a year where it just took a lot of help, uh, certainly in the springtime, getting bees ready. It, it took all of those people. Uh, we fed a lot of sucrose syrup. When uh, we would bring tanker loads in, on average, we were bringing in two tanker loads a week. When we were getting bees ready for California, we'd fill these IBC totes. Uh, and then we'd, uh, one of the, the methods that we would open feed is we would fill buckets, uh, two-gallon buckets, and we would create feed stations. With these large yards of 200 hives, there wasn't enough natural resources to, to help those bees to grow. There was enough pollen coming in, natural pollen, but we supplemented with, uh, with liquid sucrose, and we found that this really made a difference in growing the bees. And that's, uh, tomorrow's talk is about nutrition. Uh, getting bees ready for California is a big job. Uh, all the contracts that I went to, uh, the hives were inspected. It was a fairly thorough inspection. Uh, I'll show you what the, the yards look like, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we started shipping bees late, late January, early February, and the target date was to get everything on the ground by the, uh, the 10th of February, just prior to bloom. Uh, took a lot of people to get bees ready. One of the things getting into California they have strict regulations. They have ag stations where uh, the regulation talks about uh, fire ants and other types of ants. They'll inspect your truck. The inspectors will come out, inspect your tractor trailer, and if they find an ant, they can make you either send you back or make you unload the, the load and wash it. So what we would do is we would change out all of our pallets in preparation, which uh, was a big job. This is what it looks like moving bees in the States. Usually we'd use tractor trailers. Um, on average load was 432 hives. We would load the bees in the evening. We would net them, and uh, I'll show you some more pictures of, of bees going across the country. Uh, we would use, uh, we had a pretty good system of feeding protein. We would make our own pollen patties. Uh, here, here's an example of making some pollen patties, and we'd put uh, because the bees were collecting pollen in, in Florida, they were starting to grow really quickly, but it took us two weeks to ship the 40-plus loads that we'd ship. So the first bees, we didn't want them to stop growing, so we'd put pollen patties, roughly eight pounds of material, under the lid, and that would help to keep the bees growing until the almond bloom started to, to come out. Um, it was really important to grade our hives, our minimum requirement was eight frames of bees, but we got a bonus for 12 frames of bees, and we were usually very successful in getting the bonus. Quality control. This is the backyard in our, our home yard. We would be bringing in, we'd have the small trucks bringing the, the, the hives into the backyard. On average, we'd have two semi-loads a, a day coming in. Uh, we'd go through, we'd sort any bad hives, we'd be putting uh, them on new pallets, and also putting the protein and some liquid feed in the hive before we loaded them. When the bees were in California, uh, I, I mentioned they were inspected. Uh, if we sorted out any weaker hives, we left them behind in Florida. We had some uh, watermelon growers that would use those for, for watermelon pollination. They grew quickly in Florida, but they just weren't big enough to put on the truck, so we left them behind. And we also started our queen operation because when the bees got back in roughly a month, we would need a lot of queens, so we kept some bees behind to start our queen operation. Uh, typically, bees are released in mid-March. Uh, and, and that's when we'd start sending them back. This is what a semi-load of bees looks like. This would be 432 hives. On this type of trailer, we'd stack them four high. We'd use double deep uh, uh, brood chambers, uh, no excluder there. And uh, let's see if we see another picture. The, this is one of the smaller trucks. We use different sized trucks. If you look in the background, you'll see some almond trees there that haven't yet bloomed. Usually when we get there, it's still pretty cold. It's winter. 
uh, taking off the nets. We try to schedule the trucks. It's four days of driving across the country legally with a logbook. On average, um, le <laughs> I got to be careful what I say. I think this is recorded. Uh, <laughs> So um, four days of driving, sometimes the trucks would show up in the daytime, we encouraged them to come at night. Uh, occasionally, if it was really hot and dry, we'd actually run them through, we'd pay the local car wash to wash the soap out of their, their, their uh, system. We'd bring the whole semi right into the truck wash and, and water it down before we took the bees off so it wouldn't be such a mess. Uh, in this case, we didn't water those bees. And you, if you, Hopefully you can see they're, they're flying in the, in the air. When they come in in the middle of the day, you have to set them down in holding yards and then use the small trucks to spread them out. Uh, we have six hives on a pallet, double deeps. So they're strapped to the pallet. Uh, just before bloom, the trees are bare. That's what, what almond trees look like. And this would be a typical set, 24 hives. You go down the road, another 24 hives, another 24 hives. Uh, we found in Australia, um, in almond pollination, they're more likely to put 120 to 130 hives in a yard. I, I think they figured out that bees fly. Um, in California, they, they like us to spread our bees out like this. Uh, it gets muddy. Uh, when, typically, it's very dry. It's desert conditions where we're, we're bringing bees for almonds. When, it does, when it's dry, the, the ground is very hard. You can barely stick a, a piece of steel into the ground. It's so hard quarter of an inch of rain, that all changes. It turns into slip sliding, and, and even if you've got four-wheel drive, you just stay off of those roads until it dries out. So here's what bloom looks like. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of almond trees in New Zealand, but certainly the, the Aussies uh, recognize this. It's gorgeous when, when the almond trees start to bloom. That's a set of four, four, uh, pal 24 hives. Um, there's another picture. You can actually see two sets there. Um, Two, two or three hundred yards apart. The growers will usually mark uh, where they want the bees. And when we're inspecting, we'll go to where the growers that I work with had a very sophisticated system. They had a random number generator. You go to every single yard, and the, on average, you look at, uh, we, we looked at 15% of the hives, so for 24 hives, that would be about three. So you show up, and they tell you, look at hive number six, hive number four, hive number eight. The next yard, they, they tell you which hives to look at. And whatever they found, and they'd count the bees, they wouldn't disrupt them overly well, but they'd lift the lid and then split the, the, the doubles be, uh, apart and count the frames of bees. And whatever they counted there, if you had a dead one, that worked against you. If you had a 15 or 16 framer, that worked in your favor. But the, they, they counted every single yard. You had to have good bees is the point. So um, it was always a sigh of relief when we left... Uh, California, that would be in, in mid-March. Uh, as soon as we leave California, we had two operations in Florida. Our wintering locations where we started in January would be South Florida. We would return to North Florida where there would be uh, spring all over again. Um, it would be lots of food there, lots of pollen, and our two operations were about 500 miles apart. So while the bees were in California, we were bringing a lot of boxes and pallets and equipment because as soon as we hit the ground, in North Florida, it was time to split bees. Uh, one other thing is, on average, when I would ship 18 or 19,000 hives to California, I didn't need that many hives for the summer. So I would sell uh, six or 7,000 hives in California, avoid trucking them all the way back to, to the East Coast, and it was still early spring, so the demand for bees, if you're going to make honey or go other places or even make splits or sell bees, was really good. So we would sell a third of our hives. That was actually a good source of income to, to sell bees after almond pollination. But the bees that we would bring back to, to North Florida were, were always good hives. Uh, we'd pretty much split most of them in half. Uh, our queen yard was going wide open to try to keep up with that. We did raise I think pretty much all of our own queens. We had about 8,000 mating nukes, so as much as possible, we were working with mated queens. We were trying to catch about 3,000 queens a week uh, during the springtime. Um, when we were a little bit behind, we would make our splits with queen cells. This is what bees look like coming back out of almonds. Uh, almonds is uh, a nutritious pollen. It actually grows bees. It's the right time of year. And if you don't have a, a pesticide issue with, with fungicide or, or other problems, then generally your bees come back really good. That's what you hope is going to happen. 
Here we are uh, grafting eggs. As I mentioned, we had a, a, a fairly large crew, and we felt that it was important to raise our own queens, so we selected the best stock we had, and we always raised our own queens. There's queen cells ready to go either into the nukes or into the splits. Uh, okay, so we came from California. We went to North Florida. That was, uh, I would say, a, a recovery time for the bees. We, we'd split, we'd take hives, split them in half, and our next pollination would be blueberry pollination in Maine on the East Coast. Now, instead of frames of bees, the, uh, we also had our bees inspected, but they wanted frames of brood because it's later in the spring, early summer. On average, our, um, our contracts called for 10 frames of brood. So in our splitting, we had to be careful not to split too hard. We had to split them in such a way that they would grow back to 10 frames of brood by the middle of May. Uh, Maine was a little bit easier to ship bees. We didn't have the ag station uh, problems, and uh, it was a little bit shorter, too. It was 17 or 1,800 miles, which still is a long trip. Uh, that's roughly three days on a truck. And uh, it took a lot of people to get the bees ready because we're taking them they're making honey in North Florida, so you, sometimes you have to lighten them. We still put the pollen patties under the lid, and we put some liquid syrup in the feeder. Uh, we found that bees travel better when they have some liquid there. They don't uh, tear out the open brood when they're going long distances on the back of a truck. This is what a blueberry field looks like in Maine, and, and the first time, 1982, was the first year that I pollinated blueberries, and somebody brought me to a field like this, and I looked around, and I said, where's the blueberries? Um, this is what wild blueberries, they're, they're called low bush, and this is what they look like in, in flower. They're only six or eight inches off the ground, um, several, uh, you, you, on an upright you could have several blossoms. And when we first started going to Maine with two to three hives per acre, uh, we were actually generating, uh, the bees were gaining some weight off of this. They do produce nectar. The pollen's not very nutritious, so we were feeding protein to, to try to keep the bees moving ahead, but you can actually make uh, make honey on this if, if their stocking rate isn't crazy. As we worked longer in blueberries, we found that some of the growers would increase the stocking rate as much as 10 hives per acre, and then it was really hard on the bees, so uh, we had to supplement with syrup as well as protein. We had, uh, I had three different growers that I worked with. Each one of them had a, a different uh, concept of how they were going to put out bees. Uh, one grower liked large yards with 120 hives to them. Uh, the, we used bobcat loaders, uh, and in this case, they wanted us to put them in the road. We had another grower that didn't want us to put them in the road, and you had to know the difference because it, uh, it worked out that way. Uh, generally, we'd use the small trucks uh, to, to spread bees out. Um, we always used a bobcat loader, small truck or big truck. Sometimes we used the big trucks if the, the ground was good enough. Uh, we had some really rough areas that the big trucks couldn't get around. But wherever possible, the 10 wheelers worked really well, too. This is a smaller yard. You can see it's gravel. And that's blueberries in the background. It's um, mountain, hilly country, not mountainous, but hilly country. Uh, and the blueberries grow wild. Uh, the, the management scheme for blueberries is you cut off the trees, you burn it, and it takes two years to, to produce a crop of blueberries. One year, uh, well, let's say you, burn, you, you grow a crop, you burn it that year after the crop is done. The next year, the, the uprights come up, and the following year, uh, you produce fruit on it. So it's a two-year deal. So each year, we were switching back and forth between cropland and prune land. You notice these fences out in front. When we arrive in Maine, uh, the bears are just coming. Not koala bears, by the way. Um, <laughs> big black bears. I don't have a picture of big black bear, but we had big black bears that were hungry. They'd be coming out of hibernation. And uh, early on, we didn't protect our hives, and we had a lot of damage. So it got to the point where you had to fence every single yard. And fortunately, most of the time, we were able to get the, the uh, grower to take responsibility for the fencing. And uh, if we had bear damage, they actually would pay us for the bear damage. And we had two different rates. If they, if they fenced them properly, then we wouldn't charge them as much, but there were some growers that didn't like to fence them, and then we had to charge more for the bees because we pretty much knew they were going to get destroyed. Uh, this is a smaller yard here uh, of, of bees, but you see the bear fence there. Uh, here's another one where we put them on the road. Sometimes they would have the fences set up, and you'd have to sneak the bees in there a little bit, and other times you'd set the bees down, and then they'd come behind and fence them. Um, gorgeous country, really gorgeous country. Okay, so. 
from uh, blueberries bloom from the middle of May to the middle of June. Uh, as soon as they released from, from uh, blueberries, as early and later varieties, as soon as we had loads released, it was about 400 miles south to go to cranberries. We'd start loading one to two semis every night to get them out of blueberries. We'd have people on the ground, usually in Maine, to, if there were any bad ones. Uh, if we did our job right in Florida, it was usually less than 5% bad hives. But we'd bring the bees to, to pollinate cranberries south in Massachusetts. Uh, and we put another set of pollen patties because cranberries have the same problem. The quality of pollen and actually the, the availability of nectar is not that good. So we would fill the, feeder, the, fill the inside feeders and put pollen patties on them again. Because uh, the whole key to this is to have big, strong hives. We're providing a service. Uh, so that's what we were focused on. This is what a cranberry bog looks like. Um, it's a, both wild blueberries and cranberries are, are native plants in in our area in North America. Uh, this is not the same plant as blueberries, but it grows uh, six or seven inches off the ground. It's a vine. Uh, you can't really see it, but this is actually just starting to flower. It's a tiny white flower. Generally doesn't produce much nectar, but, and you have early and late varieties, but uh, the bees are there for roughly a month. When we bring the bees in, it's a lot of small bogs that we're working with. I actually had close to 200 growers. Uh, one day I Somebody asked me of, about small growers. I had almost 50 growers. It only took a single pallet. Fortunately, I had some larger growers that took more bees than that. But um, the semis would come in every morning. We'd unload them in a loading yard. And the next evening, we'd start spreading them out. And on average, we'd put seven or 800 hives out a night on, uh, to, to keep up with it because we had a window to work. We wanted to make sure they were all on the ground before the, uh, the bloom starts. You can see white pine trees in the background there. Um, this is in Massachusetts. This is what cranberries look like when you harvest them. Um, I don't think they grow cranberries in this part of the world, but uh, it takes a certain amount, of, a certain type of conditions, a lot of water, uh, sandy soil, and people think that they grow in the water. They don't, uh, but you use water uh, in a cranberry. Usually there's dikes around the bogs, and in the winter, you'll flow those, you'll, you'll put water over the top to protect them from the cold. You'll, you'll flow the bog, you'll let it freeze, you'll drain the water off, and you have an ice layer protecting the bogs, uh, the berries and the vine from, from uh, frost damage. And then you also use water during harvest season. This is how they harvest cranberries. They're actually hollow inside. So uh, when it's time to harvest, they'll flood the bogs. They have a machine that knocks them off the vine, they float. You pull them in in corrals and you pump them into trucks. Uh, these are bumblebees. Um, this company, Copert, has been fairly successful in, in growing bumblebees. I, I don't know if that's uh, something they're doing a lot in this part of the world, but uh, they are uh, a native bee for North America, and there was some interest. Uh, they don't replace honeybees, but they, if you get bumblebees and honeybees, they seem to complement each other. Each one of those green boxes is four hives. Um, they're roughly two foot square. The hives aren't very big. Uh, they're supposed to have 200 bees in each one. of So you're looking at eight hives right there, uh, fairly small. They're supposed to have 200 bees, but they tell you not to open them. Uh, every farmer that I know, the first thing they do is open them and count the bees. And um, Bumblebees start from a single bee and grow later in the season. Uh, typically, on, on, by the time cranberries are in bloom, you'll have 50 or 60 bees in each one of those hives. So one bumblebee is better than one honeybee, but the volume just isn't there to, to actually pollinate the crop. So July is the end of July, finally the end of pollination season. We're, we're exhausted. The bees are exhausted. But um, it's the end of our pollination season, and it's time to uh, get everything back in Florida. We ship all our bees back to South Florida. Uh, as soon as they arrive, there's typically a good pollen flow in South Florida, which is key because in cranberries and blueberries, the quality of the pollen hasn't been that good. So we finally have a good pollen flow, but we supplement with, uh, with syrup. Uh, as the bees come in, we have large crews. We'll unload the sem one or two semi-loads in our backyard, and we'll sort out the bad ones. And then that night, we'll, we'll be spreading them out to the small yards, and we'll, we'll put 150 to 200 hives in a yard. Um, this is the backyard. When they come in, it's, it's a little chaotic, but it, we actually know what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> 
This, this is a typical fall yard. Uh, it's the wet season when bees come back. Uh, we are in a tropical area where it uh, rains on average from May to October. So your bees are getting back. The grass is really tall. We don't fuss about that. The trick is finding the high spot. And in Florida, that can be four inches higher on one side of the field than the other side of the field, because when it rains, you really don't want your bees to go underwater. So uh, if we have wet areas, we'll put um, pallets underneath them to, to raise the bees up. We run a couple of our own sem or ran a couple of our own semis, but for the most part, we hired trucks because uh, of the volume we were moving. We needed 30 or 40 trucks in two weeks. There was no way that we could uh, we could do that with our own trucks. But we did find uh, truck drivers and owner operators that like to haul bees. We if we paid really well and we encouraged them to come back and uh, treated them really well. And we found that hauling bees is not for everybody. Um, we, I'll tell you one quick story. I've, I've had this several times. A guy will show up and he'll look around and uh, say, I'm here to load a truck. And uh, he thought he was coming for a load of beans, B-E-A-N-S. And when we showed him the boxes, he left. <laughs> so now the real, uh, I, I don't want to cut this short, but the real beekeeping starts in August. This is the six months of, of recovery. Um, the bees are back in the, on the ground. We've started the queen yard uh, before they get there. We, usually the hives are on the ground for three or four weeks. We like to get a good round of brood going and we start splitting. And on average, we'll split our hives twice in the fall. Now splitting hives in the fall when the days are getting shorter is tricky. Uh, we, I can talk, I can't, I don't have the time now, but I'll, I'd love to, to tell you more about the challenges that, that are splitting bees when the days are getting shorter. We have temperature and we have some food coming in, but the instinct of the bees to grow is not the same when the days are getting shorter. Uh, this is one example of, of making fall splits. Uh, usually, we'll, sometimes we'll do bust up, sometimes we'll split the hives in half. Uh, the general rule is we, want to, we have a target date of, of early November where we want the bees to be a certain strength, so the early ones will split a little bit weaker and the later ones will split a little stronger. Uh, we put a lot of new foundation. I mentioned we sell six or 7,000 hives each year, which means we got to put 14 or 15,000 deep boxes into our outfit each year. Uh, we were using a wooden frame with a plastic-based foundation with a good heavy coating of wax. In our queen program, we selected for queens that, that were good wax producers. This is a frame that would have been put in maybe a month before, and those are well-nourished bees. That's, that's what you want to see, new foundation, uh, and going in the right direction here. Uh, when you're making splits, you need good stuff to work with. That's, that's what we find uh, with our own queen selection we've, and nutrition, we've been able to, uh, to have good frames. We call that wood to wood. So September, we have a good fall honey flow. Um, many beekeepers in Florida use that to produce honey for sale. We used it to make bees. So we would split bees throughout the whole uh, honey flow. Not to say that we wouldn't produce some honey, uh, it wasn't a nuisance, but for the most part, when we had honey in our way, we extracted it so we could have the comb to make splits again. Um, by October, we're still, we'll actually split until early November. Uh, sometimes we're doing some extracting. Uh, these are the trucks that we use. They're all four-wheel drive. Um, always have a bobcat that goes along with them. November's slowing down a little bit. Uh, we're, the bees are at their lowest point of the year. That's when we, we've been treating for Varroa throughout the year, but this is when we really get a good dose in. Uh, we supplement our protein as needed. We make our own pollen patties. That's tomorrow's talk. Um, this is the mixer. Uh, December, we, we are slowing down a little bit. We try to give the guys a, a little time off at Christmas. I know that's the middle of your summer, but it's supposed to be our slow time. But because we have almond pollination right around the corner, we found that it, it really doesn't slow down that much for us. So um, I don't have a lot of time, but come visit us, please. Thank you. <laughs>